Good morning. So I am not Matt Spear. Don't know if you could tell. Um, maybe the belly tipped you off. But uh, I am Julia Geiger. Matt is taking a very well-earned break with his wife in Mexico. Um, he's having a great time. And so he has asked me to step in today, which I take as a great honor. So like I said, my name is Julia. And I serve with the student team here at Bridgepoint. Where are my students at? Yeah. I love students so much. I seriously, I love this age. I'm so passionate about it. They are amazing. They're so smart and they're so cool and their brains are just swimming in hormones and sometimes bad decisions. But I love it because they're so hungry and they're so alive and they want to learn and they want to do amazing things for the world. And it's amazing to me sometimes that I am so passionate about students because I myself did not have a great experience in high school, mostly because of the aforementioned swimming in hormones thing. Um, it's a hard time. It's hard to be a teenager. Um, but also, another big reason why I did not have a great time as a student was because I didn't work very hard in school. I didn't care very much. Uh, my grades were always really bad. I rarely ever turned in homework. Um, and it's, yeah, it's because I didn't care very much, unfortunately. And once I went to college, all of a sudden, I cared a lot more. And that's interesting what having to pay for your own schooling will do um, for your GPA. It's a lot better for my college than it was for high school. But yeah, high school, I, I didn't try very much. And when I was in high school, I remember I was a, a couple of months from graduating. And, uh, and I was barely going to graduate. <laughs> and I didn't have a plan for after high school. And I hadn't applied to any colleges at that point. I ended up taking a gap year. But at that point, at the end of my high school, I was like, I don't have a plan. I don't really know what's next. And this just kind of looming adulthood was standing before me. And all of a sudden, I remember it hit me at one point. I don't know how to pay a bill. And I don't know why that, to me, like summed up my inadequacy to like enter adulthood. <laughs> but to me, I was like, man, like I, OK, I know the Pythagorean theorem. That's great. But like, I don't know how to pay a bill. I don't even know anything to do with taxes. Um, and that's not any sort of commentary on the school system. It's not their job to teach me how to pay a bill or to be an adult. but. I do remember feeling very unprepared to leave high school and to enter into adulthood. And my, you know, my high school was like, okay, well, uh, here's your diploma that you barely earned. Good job there, um, and best of luck to you out in the world. Like, we'll see you. We're not, you know, we're not a part of this process anymore. We're done. Our part is done. Good luck. And sometimes I wonder if we can treat our Christian walk the same way. That we can look at God and see, you know, that he's given us like this ticket to heaven. And he said, okay, here's your salvation. Um, see you, you know, whenever I come back or whenever you die. And uh, in the meantime, best of luck to you, <laughs> you know? And like, hey, it's rough out there, so you're gonna need it, you know? And, and we, we think that he's just kind of plopped us down here and that we're left to fend for ourselves and we're just told, best of luck. And anytime anything gets hard, we're just kind of almost leaning on the fact of like, okay, just kind of got to hold on until I make it to heaven or until Jesus comes back. Um, and then everything gets set right to the way that it's supposed to be. And the question then becomes, are we living from a victory that has already been won? Or are we believing the lie from the enemy that we're fighting a losing battle? So we're going to camp out today for a while in 1 Samuel 17 in a story that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, whether it's from, you know, the felt boards in, in nursery church and, or it's from, you know, some maybe really powerful sermon you heard at student camp one time or, or maybe a pastor has tackled it at some point in your life. But it's the story of a young shepherd boy who defeats a giant named Goliath and saves his people from enemy invasion. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel 17. And I'm going to set the scene for you a little bit. So 
At this point in Israel's history, they are settled in the promised land. Everything that they've needed to do to get there and to settle has already been done. They, they got out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. They were in the desert, in the wilderness. They, they crossed the Red Sea. They, they, the walls of Jericho have fallen down. All of these things have already happened, and they are now in the land. But they have an arch enemy in the land. And these are people known as the Philistines. And they keep just coming up against them again and again. And it's all throughout Judges and 1 Samuel that they keep hitting into these people named the Philistines. And even at one point, the Philistines actually steal the sacred Ark of the Covenant, which is a really important relic to the people of Israel. And they basically take it for a joyride around their nation for several months. So when we enter our story, there is already very bad blood between Israel and the Philistines. And so this is where our story begins, where the Philistines have decided once again, they're going to gather their forces and they're going to bring a war to Israel. So we start in verse three. The Philistines were standing on one hill and the Israelites were standing on another hill with a ravine between them. Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet, nine inches tall and wore a bronze helmet and bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins and a bronze javelin was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam and the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking out in front of them. <clears throat> He stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formations, why do you come out to line up in battle formation, he asked them. Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose one of your own men and have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so that we can fight each other. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. So I want to stop out here to make a point. Like I said, they are already in the promised land. All of these amazing things that God has done for them, Egypt, Jericho, crossing the sea, it's all in their rearview mirror that they can look back on and see we've already seen God's power and his might and his faithfulness, and we're here in the land of promise. And yet, even in the land of promise, there is an enemy that has come out to torment them and to dishonor their God. There are still enemies in the promised land. We are in Christ and we still have an enemy that comes up to us and terrorizes us in our own land. And I don't know what your 9-9 nine, nine enemy looks like. That's, that's pretty darn tall if you think about it. I don't know if any of y'all know that uh, Daniel Bisgrove, he's like really tall. I think he's like 6'7". So if you just add three feet to that, like he's already taller than everyone I know, and add three feet to that, that is pretty darn tall. And I don't know what that enemy looks like in your life, but I think every single one of us know what it feels like to come face to face with something that is a lot bigger than us. It's possible and common to be in Christ and still have a battle. We are not given a promise of sunshine and rainbows after we put our faith in Christ. Just because we're in Christ doesn't mean we don't still have a fight. Goliath he, he was a giant that was coming in to terrorize him, but he wasn't the only giant in the land. He actually had four brothers, and they were terrorizing Israel after him, and I think sometimes we can feel that. We're like, yep, I, I feel like I'm facing Goliath and all four of his brothers, and, and maybe one gets knocked down, or I get a moment of reprieve, and another one pops up, or maybe it's smooth sailing for a little while, and then my anxiety hits me like a wall in the face, and I'm saying, how, look at how big that is. I couldn't possibly ever see or, or fight that. And I, this tells me something 
that is very important, which is that the enemy wants you to give up ground that you've already been given. And we see in this story that it's possible for God's people to be living under his power, to be living under his protection, and still be paralyzed with fear and to lose their courage in front of the enemy. It's possible to be a child of God and believe the enemy's lie that you're screwed. We're told that the army of Israel lived like this for 40 days, every day. They would go out and they would line up their battle and make their formations, and then Goliath would step out and he'd taunt them and he'd challenge them and he'd dishonor their God, and they would all just freeze and no real fighting would happen and they'd go back to their camps. And I wonder how many of us fall into this trap without realizing it that we're in God's promise, that we've seen his faithfulness time and time again, but then an an enemy enters in the room and we freeze and we're paralyzed. And not just that, but we let him stay. And I hate, it makes me so sad to think of God's people and they're in their camps and they're making themselves as comfortable as they possibly can in their tents and they've got little brothers coming in, bringing them rations and they're sitting around their fires and then all they have to endure is just once a day an enemy coming in and terrorizing them and paralyzing them in fear. And I'm not sure what they were thinking, if they were thinking maybe Goliath would at some point get bored and leave, (laughs) or if maybe they were thinking that they'd run out of supplies and that they would eventually decide to turn back. But our enemy is not going to get bored and leave. He's not going to turn around. He wants us paralyzed in fear. He doesn't even really want us to fight him. He just wants us frozen, and he wants us to make room for him and his lies in our life because then he can keep us living in the just enough rather than the life abundant that Jesus has promised us. And if that's where you're at today, I'm very happy to tell you it does not have to be like that. So we're going to pick back up in our story in verse 20. So we have Jesse is David's father, and he has sent David out to the camp, and he says, okay, bring them some supplies. It's been, you know, 40 days. He wants you to bring them some supplies, bring them some food, and also just check in on them, see, see how they're doing. So we pick up in verse 20. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation, facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. When he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was speaking with them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, The Philistine from Gath came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. When all the Israelite men saw Goliath, they retreated from him terrified. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So we have an army of grown men, including the leader, the king of Israel, who are so terrified of Goliath that the battle is at a standstill. There's no actual fighting that has occurred yet. (laughs) Just one giant man coming out every day and taunting them and then leaving. And they don't do anything and they don't say anything and they don't make any moves or any action. And David comes in and he hears Goliath one time and his instant reaction is, okay, who is this guy? 
He's going to talk about our God this way. He's going to talk about the God of Israel this way. Who is this joker? And I want this mindset so desperately. I want it for me, and I want it for every single person who is in Christ. That we would come face to face with our nine-foot enemy and say, okay, yeah, sure, that's big. (laughs) That's bigger than anyone I know. But man, have you seen my God? That David had such a view of God that he would lay down in the pasture with his sheep at night and he would look up at the heavens in awe and wonder and he would say, oh God, who is man that you are mindful of him? That was the view of his God. He had a 20,000 view foot of God so that when he came face to face with nine feet, he said, Yeah, okay, but that's nothing compared to that. That's nothing compared to the one for whom I'm after his own heart. That is nothing compared to the one whom I've spent day after day seeing his faithfulness and his good works that I have a relationship with. That he has seen, I want to be able to keep in mind all the times that God has brought me through the worst of situations, that I've seen the miracles that he's already worked so that anything that would come against him, I know must bow to his power and his might. And this is the truth today. We do not have to partner with the enemy's lies about us or our God. And you might say, whoa, whoa, I'm, I'm not partnering with it. Like, I'm not on the enemy's side. But I'm going to tell you right now that to endure the lies is to partner with it. To make room for them in your life is to partner with it. To let the lies of the enemy defame the holy and powerful name of your God is partnering enough. James 4 tells us that when we oppose the devil, that he must flee from us. But we have to oppose him. We have to resist him. We have to take that stance against him that David was willing to take that no one else was. And we have to be willing to say that of, no, no, you're a liar. You're not more powerful than my God. So Samuel, 1 Samuel 1732, Saul, the king, he hears that David has been asking around, you know, okay, what, what's going to be done for this person? And, you know, the, the Israelites are telling him, like, well, it's pretty good. Like, you're going to get riches, and you're going to get to marry his daughter, and you also exempt from taxes, which is, you know, a good reminder, by the way, tomorrow is tax day. And uh, I think that that can kind of give us an extra heaviness of like, oh, that'd be pretty good. Like, get the IRS off my back for life. That sounds awesome. And yet even with all of these amazing, you know, this tempting offer, no one, that's not enough for any one of the Israelite army to be willing to step forward and face this enemy. But David, he goes to Saul and he tells Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And it's it's amazing. So, you know, you've got this 9-9 giant. He's come out and he's challenged and he said, okay, you know, I'm the best man in my army. You send forward your best man and we'll just go one-on-one. And David says, steps forward, and and there's some debate on how old he is, somewhere between 15 and 20, but he's a young man. You know, he, he is young. He doesn't have a ton of experience fighting, or so we think, because then when Saul questions him, and he's like, you're just a boy. This guy's been fighting since he was your age. You know, how, how are you going to go against him? And David says, yeah, but I've been watching my dad's sheep, And when a lion would come, I was able to strike him down. Or when a bear would come, I was able to defeat him. And the God that delivered the lion and the bear into my hands is going to deliver this Philistine into the hands of the Israelite army. And so Saul is like, 
okay, it's a pretty good resume. Like, I'll, I'll take the shot. If you can take down a lion and a bear, that sounds pretty good. Maybe, maybe there is a chance that you can take on this giant. And here's the cool twist to the story. You are not David in the story of David and Goliath. And you might say, wait, 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 but but I was there that day at summer camp where the preacher got up on stage and he said, yeah, David, he was a young man just like you and he, he was young, and, but he fought this giant and because of faith in his God. And so you need to get your sling and pick out your stones and we're gonna take down our giants. And I was so fired up at that summer camp and I was so ready to be David and to take on my giant, but here I am 10, 20, 30, 60 years later, and that giant is still there today, taunting me just like they were when I was 15 years old. And that's, that's because you are not David in the story of David and Goliath. Jesus is David in the story of David and Goliath. God is not asking you to buck up and fight harder. He is asking you to put your focus on him, to rest in his faithfulness, to remember his faithfulness of what he's already promised you and what he's already done for you, and to let him fight the battle for you. This entire book is about one man and one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. The whole thing from Genesis to Revelation. So if we're reading this whole book looking for the name of Jesus, that means that the name of Jesus is not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but that name is in Genesis. It's in, it's in Kings, it's in Joshua, and it's in 1 Samuel 17. And if Jesus is not Goliath, <laughs> and he's not one of the Israelites, and he's not Saul, then he must be that poor boy from Bethlehem who stood in front of a giant on behalf of his people and said, no more. Jesus is our giant slayer, but it's so much better than they got with David and Goliath because he didn't just slay one giant. He took down all of hell and sin and death that day on the cross so that we could live in that freedom, that we could live in that victory. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, but thanks be to God, who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God, we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. I love this, that the triumphal procession that is mentioned here is a reference to the Romans when they would take over an enemy what they would do is they would take any captives that were left over and they would lead them through the city and there would be this huge parade and it's this celebration of victory of look, they're defeated, they're down, they are no longer a threat to us. And this is what Christ does. But even better, he says that he leads us in this procession. That he says, even though you didn't fight this battle, even though you didn't have to put on the armor and actually take down this enemy, I did it for you. You get to stand right here next to me and share in the glory and the honor of my victory. And you get to see with your own eyes that the enemy has been taken down. Jesus is not asking us to take down the enemy in our life. He has taken down the enemy. And he asks us to walk with him in victory that he has already won on our behalf. So we're going to keep reading. David has convinced Saul to let him fight Goliath. And he goes to a river and he gets some rocks for his sling and he goes to challenge the enemy. And Goliath, this 9-9 nine, nine warrior, sees this young man with his shepherd's crook and his sling. He's so offended He's like, for, for 40 days, I've been coming out to challenge you, and you haven't brought me anyone. For 40 days, I've been saying like, hey, let's go. Let's go man to man. Bring out your best man. This, this is your best man? 
this little kid who comes at me with a stick like he's, he's going to chase me away like I'm a dog. And then David does something so cool here. I love this. He flips the script on Goliath. So we're going to start in verse 45. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. The day the Lord, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel." All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Which, first of all, I love the detail here. I love the call of David. It's like Game of Thrones too. Like, this is gory, you know? He's saying, I'm going to cut off your head, and I'm going to give the bodies of you and your army to the birds and the wild animals. But here's what's cool. So remember that Goliath set the terms for the battle. And he said, we'll go man to man. And if, if you lose, you're going to serve us and you're going to be our slaves. And if we lose, you know, that's not going to happen, but we'll serve you and we'll be your slaves. And he says, these are the rules. And the, the Israelites are just like, oh, okay. you know. And it's interesting because that's not normally how that works. It's normally army against army. And, and I wonder, maybe one of two things is going on here. Maybe one, the Philistines actually didn't have enough confidence in their army to be able to go against the Israelite army. Or maybe they just had that much confidence in Goliath that they said, okay, here's our trump card that we're laying down. You know, you, you bring out your best man and we're pretty darn sure we're going to win. You see how tall this dude is? Like, we're good. But Goliath set the terms for someone challenging him. But David, he says, no, no. I'm not going to play by your rules. Okay, so, so when the Lord delivers you into my hands, you're going down, and so is that army behind you. And I love this, because Jesus does this too. Jesus doesn't just conquer the enemy. He destroys the enemy. He says, no, I'm not going to just subdue him and let him live quietly in the corner of your life. He's not going to do anything good for you. I'm not even going to let him serve you or be your slave. I'm taking him out. First Corinthians 15, 55 through 58 says, death has been swallowed up in victory where death is your victory, where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And later in Revelation 1, Jesus says, I hold the keys to death and Hades. He says, the battle's over. It's already been won. I've already defeated the enemy on your behalf. The sting of death is gone. That's why Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain, because the sting of death has been defeated. Now we have something to gain in death. And he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you might say, okay, that sounds great, but like this doesn't feel a whole lot like victory right now. Like I'm staring at my giant and he's terrorizing me and I don't feel like there's victory in my life. And, and I love the way that Pastor Louis Giglio of Fashion City Church puts it. He says, it's like if a snake, you were to cut off the head of a snake. And then you were to wait a couple of months. The poison in the snake's fangs is still potent. And if you were to step on it, 
it could wound you, it could even kill you. And so there is an aspect of an already, but a not yet. There will be a day where Jesus comes to finish it once and for all. And he says, yes, I know the enemy's still talking, but his power has already been defeated. And are we going to trust in that? So you say, okay, we have the victory, but how, how do we live in it? And the first thing we have to do to live from victory is we have to fight to focus our eyes on Jesus. And y'all, it is a fight to focus your eyes on Jesus. The mentor that I had right after I got married, she used to say something on a pretty regular basis to me, especially when I was like really frustrated with my own weakness or my own humanity. And I'd be like, man, like, why do I just keep letting the enemy lie to me again and again and again, even though I learn all these amazing things and I see what God has done, and then I just I let the enemy come in and lie to me again. Why do I do that? And she would say, Julia, we are dumb sheep. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> what does that mean? She says, no, it's true. When, when Jesus says that he's our shepherd and we're his sheep, that's not a flattering thing to say about people. Sheep are very dumb, and they're gross, and their eyesight is terrible. They can't see two feet in front of them, and they'll just walk straight into like a really rushing, intense river and like dunk their head to try and get some water, and they'll be like taken out by the river. They're not smart, but that's why we need a shepherd. And yes, we are amazing and we're fearfully and wonderfully made, but in comparison to the wisdom and the might and the honor of our Father, we are dumb sheep. And I know this to be true in my own life. And it makes me think of at the end of Joshua, when God has brought his people through the wilderness and he takes them through and he crosses, you know, he splits the Jordan River and they cross the Jordan River. They walk through on dry land. And after they get to the other side, he says, okay, now I want you to collect 12 stones and put them in the center of the river and make an altar. And I want you to do this because when your kids ask me, hey, what's that altar for? I want you to tell them this is what the Lord has done. This is our God. He brought us out of Egypt. He brought us through the wilderness. And now we're here in the promised land. And it, it's so good, this land flowing with milk and honey. And it's our God who did it. And he says, I want you to set up this altar as a reminder because I want you to remind yourselves. I want you to teach your kids this is who I am. Oh, and then like the last verses of Joshua says, the next generation came. They did not know God. They did not know what he had done. And I'm like, oh God, like one generation, you literally told them, like, tell your kids what I've done. And all it took was one generation for them to not know the might and the power of their God. And it's because we are dumb sheep. And it's why we need altars in our lives. We need these regular reminders that remind us that we see them and we say, oh, that's right. That's who my God is. That's what he's done. And it makes me think of, so I, I was taking my mom to the airport this weekend, this week, and uh, if any of y'all have driven through Atlanta, you know that like sometimes it gets really confusing, especially if you're not used to driving through Atlanta, and it's like the highway, and it's like, oh, and there was my exit, you know? And if you lose your focus, it's just really easy for you to, for you to miss your exit. So I, was, I drove my mom to the airport, and I was driving home, I had my kid in the back, and so, you know, I'm talking to him and whatever, and I, I lose my focus, and I missed my exit. And I was like, oh, okay. So then Waze is recalculating for me, and it says, okay, you know, you, you just take the next exit, and then you got to turn around, you got to retrace your steps, and then you'll get back on your original exit. And I look over, and I see that the space between the exit I need to turn around on and the one that I need to have originally taken is just slammed with traffic. And I'm like, ugh. <laughs> Sometimes there are consequences when we lose our focus. This is part of living our life here on earth. When we do something that hurts someone, we don't just 
get to say, well, I'm living in victory in Christ, so things just get to, there are no consequences. If you step out on your marriage, you have to earn back that trust. It's something my dad used to say a lot, especially when we were kids, is if we, if we lied to him or if we'd hidden something from him, he, he would say, you know, you have to regain my trust. You have to work to earn my trust back because that's how it works with human relationships. And sometimes, and even if we just lose our focus and we've let the enemy come in and tell us a lie for a while and we've believed it for a while, it's going to take us a little bit to unravel that lie from inside of us. And it's because there are consequences to losing our focus in Jesus. But I love that we have a God who says, yeah, but I'm always going to provide that next exit for you. And maybe the more exits you keep blowing past, the longer you're going to have to retrace your steps. And maybe it'll be a little more painful every time. But I am always giving you that next exit right in front of you to say, hey, get back on track. Focus back up on me. Live in my victory. Live in my truth. And he doesn't just say, well, we missed your exit. You're done now. (laughs) No more second chances. But he gives us second, third, 175th chances and I think about Peter walking on the water, you know, and he's, he's full of faith and he's doing it and he's walking on the water with Jesus. And then it says that he takes his eyes off Jesus. He loses his focus and he starts looking at the wind and the waves, starts looking at his circumstances around him. And he gets focused on the fact that they're scary rather than the fact that he's got his God right there who he just saw feed 4,000 people with a couple of loaves and fish. And he starts to sink. And I love that Jesus wasn't just like, Ugh, Peter, you lost, your, you lost your faith. Like, you lost your focus. I'm just going to let you drown for a little bit. I'm just going to let you, you know, freak out in the water for a little bit. No, he immediately, he grabs him back up. And he says, it's okay. Just keep focusing back on me and we'll keep going. And that is our God. That is the God that we serve. We serve a God who will always give us that next chance, who will always reach out and grab our hands and will not let us drown. The second thing we have to do in order to live from victory is to stand firm. You know, and it's like the Israelites, they're in the land They're in the promised land. And there's an enemy that's coming in and trying to invade. And y'all, that is us. We are in Christ. Ephesians 6, it goes through the armor of God. And it's telling you all these things to, to put on in order to fight the lies of the enemy. And then I love that it says, therefore, stand firm. And it doesn't tell us to take an offensive position, but a defensive one. And that's because we already have everything that we need. We already have the victory. We are already a child of God. We already have the most important thing we could ever have, and that is the great and powerful and beautiful name of Jesus Christ. And that is all we need. We have him. We have his spirit living inside of us. And I love that. And I, that's so key because even though sometimes we're dumb sheep, we get it so much better than David ever did because we have his spirit inside of us. And it says that his spirit is constantly telling our spirit that we're a child of God. And I'm like, yep, God, I need that. I need your spirit continually telling my spirit who I am, who you are, what you've done, because I will lose focus so fast. And we fight to focus, but he helps us fight to focus when we invite him in. And yes, there's still pain. Yes, there are still battles. But we, are we fighting these battles from a mindset of victory that has already been won on our behalf? Are we fighting these battles from a mindset of protecting the ground that has already been taken for us? We're not trying 
the enemy, see the enemy wants to come in and say, oh, look at that, you struggled with that temptation, or oh, look at that, you messed up. Now look at, now you've gotta, you've gotta recover all of this. And he, he wants to convince us that we're trying to, to take something that we need, but we're not. We already have what we need. And that's the very sneaky lie of the enemy that we need to rebuke and call out is that, no, I'm protecting what I already have that you're trying to convince me that I don't. And maybe you look around and you say, but my circumstances don't feel a lot like victory. And there I have to ask you, what circumstances are you looking at? Are you looking at my anxiety is taking me over, my depression, I can't get my head above water, this relationship, I just can't gain any ground on, this, this thing, I just keep hitting wall after wall after wall in this area. Are you looking at what's going on around you and saying, this feels like defeat, and so it must be? Or are you resting in the truth of Ephesians 2 that says you are seated in heavenly places in Christ so that in the coming ages, God might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to you? What would it look like if we lived this truth out? Anytime the enemy came to us to say, look at what you're going through. God has clearly abandoned you. God is clearly not powerful enough for this situation. Look at what you're fighting against. It's clearly not enough, and he's left you to fend for yourself and just said, here's your diploma, good luck. And we can look at this nine-foot giant and say, yeah, you're pretty big, but have you seen my God? And I'm, I'm right here, I'm in the middle of my circumstances and I'm fighting them, but I'm also with him, seated in heavenly places and he is lavishing his goodness and his love and his mercy on me. And that is the mindset that we have to fight to protect because that is the truth that our victory comes from, the truth of who our God is and who we are in him. So we're gonna go into a time of communion like we do every week and, and you're gonna have a chance to take the elements and we've got some candles and some prayer cards if you wanna write a paper or um, just write it, that's just between you and God, no one else sees that. Or if you wanna light a candle that's been shown throughout church history as sending up a prayer to God. And as you're taking these elements, one, I want you to remember that communion is one of our modern day altars to God. He says, I've set it up, this thing for you to do on a regular basis to remember who I am and what I've done. We need those, we need those so bad. And so take this, take this as the gift that it is, this time with him and remember who he is and what he's done and the victory that you have as a result. And also, as you're taking the elements, I ask that you would ask God to show you just how big he is, just how vast. I'm gonna go ahead and pray. God, you are so good. You are so faithful. Thank you that you are powerful and that you have won the greatest victory that we could ever need on our behalf. God, I just ask that you show every single one of us the vastness of who you are so that when the enemy comes against us and starts trying to lie to us, we wouldn't have the view of the Israelites who are just looking at nine feet, nine inches and saying, that's too big for me. But God, we would have the view of that shepherd boy who says, 
Yeah, it's too big for me, but that is not too big for my God. That he is way bigger than the enemy could ever be, infinitely bigger. And God, I just, I just ask that you show us, you show us how big you are. You remind us, not just today, but daily, because we need to hear the truth again and again because we forget it so easily. I know I do. God, we open up ourselves for the truth of your spirit to speak to us just how big you are so that when the enemy comes in and tries to lie, that we know that he's nothing compared to you. God, we love you. We praise you. You are so good in your name.